Peter, you just recently sent me an article you wrote called, let me get the title here, From the Commodity to Communism. Do you want to give us a little introduction to who you are and what led you to writing this article in the first place? Oh, yes. Um, First of all, thanks for uh, letting me participate in this show. So this article is the English translation of a Swedish original that appeared in the final issue of Riffraff, which was a magazine, a theoretical magazine, that appeared in the early 2000s. In 2002 was the first issue. I was part of the editorial board of Riffraff since about 2003. Uh, shortly after the project was started. And this journal, it was like a political project, but more of a, a theoretical nature. This article, From the Commodity to Communism, is the English translation of an article that I wrote for the journal Riffraff, the final issue, number 10, that was published last year. Would it be correct to say that this was a, a communizer journal? It became a communizing journal. From the start, it was uh, more like anti-Leninist, Marxist class struggle uh, journal. Uh, Its uh, subtitle is uh, Communism Class Struggle Theory. And it originated as the theoretical magazine of of a political group called Folkmacht, which I was never part of. But when this group disbanded, it was inspired by uh, the British group Class War, and also some various council communist groups. But anyway, this group uh, disbanded, but they, the theoretical magazine lived on, which I joined. And so um, this magazine was uh, more like a, a theoretical or, a, or like a re- research project in the sense that the people who were involved uh, didn't try to do propaganda, but rather to... Uh, we translated texts that we found interesting and we wrote texts out by ourselves. And then usually in the next issue, we, we criticized our previous positions or sort of uh, tried to uh, move forward in our understanding of uh, capitalism and, and struggles that were taking place. And so the, there was no political position except that class struggle from below and sort of non-Leninist, uh, non-statist views were shared among, among all of the participants. And so there were people with a more like a council communist position and there were some individuals insp- greatly inspired by autonomous theory or autonomous ma- Marxism, as it was called. But over time, the group uh, developed towards a position of communization or started to become more like uh, defending a position. But it is take, this took a couple of years. Do you want to maybe then distinguish how you see it, the differences between like this autonomous Marxism, council communism, and juxtapose that with a communizer position? Yeah, so I can um, translate the part of uh, the introduction to Riffraff number five which tries to summarize different positions. So let's see, I, I'll try to, this does not exist in English, and so I'm translating right now. Um, schematically, you could divide the theories of the proletariat in three uh, compartments. It's important to stress that all these theories have a material basis. One, theories that emphasize the proletariat organizing as variable capital labor power organized in uh, unions and parties. Communism or socialism is thus the same thing as state capitalism or party rule. Two, theories that emphasize the self-activity of the proletariat and see communism or socialism as being self-management of workplaces and the economy. Communism is seen as workers' power or workers' control and uh, social uh, organization. And three, theories that focus on how the self-organized class is antagonistic towards its own proletarian situation and tries to break with this situation by going beyond it. The production of communism is only possible 
by the working class uh, destroying itself as a class. So this third point of view became the focus of uh, the journal. This led us in contact with other sister projects such as Aufheben in Britain that later became EndNotes and other groups in France, Greece and um, individuals in many different parts of the West. So one of the basic ideas here is that why did previous revolutions fail? Even when, even when uprising succeeded, uh, what happened was like in the USSR, a new government was formed and a new system or economic system was established, which was not very different from what existed before. And so what happened was that the, the group discovered uh, that there was a tendency mainly in France around the, the group uh, Tronoir and Gilles Dubé, who would be the main theoretician, uh, who had this term for changing society, making the revolution not being something that is separate from the future society, or instead of taking power either through a party or through workers' councils so that afterwards another society could be established. And so he instead formulated a problem being making revolution by making communism, in which the class is abolishing itself. And so this was describing the revolutionary process, which was uh, very similar to, or it was uh, a variant or, or there are similarities in this position with, uh, with other, other theories of the revolution that we knew of at the time. And this autonomous position was, of, was of course, I mean, inspired by or, or, or developed out of class struggle in Italy, in which the refusal of work was central. And so it was uh, not just, we saw this uh, being not just a theory, but also having a basis in, in, in practice. And so how does communization differentiate itself, say, from that position of, of, of say, Gilles Dubé? There was an initiative to create a joint journal of all the various groups that had identified or talked about communization. Uh, it was an invite sent out and a, a journal called Meeting. So this was an initiative by the group Thierry Communiste in uh, southern France. Dove and uh, the group around him uh, decided not to join, even if the positions or like the understanding of communization being essentially the same. What happened was that uh, this variant or like uh, understanding of communization and other concepts around that or theory communist, that became later more like an organized tendency, inter international organized tendency. Uh, what happened was that uh, the people who got uh, in contact with each other uh, were those that were closer to theory communist. And they were in large agreement with, uh, with Dove, but uh, they had a under different understanding of history, which was significant. So if you want to go into the details of the differences, then uh, you could read uh, When Insurrections Die, and then the critique of, of this text called Normative History. And so these texts are published in the first issue of EndNotes. It would be the easiest way for for an English speaker to uh, get into these <laughs> differences, but so you yourself, you am I right to say that you actually lived above the the location for the printing presses for Theory Communiste? Yeah. So uh, what happened was that this uh, this group uh, Theory Communiste they had a lot of text in French uh, that we to read because we were only able to read in English basically. So I I had to to learn French somehow. And uh, what happened was that I actually moved down to France and I hung out with, uh, with these people, which was uh, really great because you have a very nice atmosphere in southern France. But uh, yeah, <laughs> what can I say? Do you want to tell me how, how and why your ideas began to change from a kind of in what would be a more orthodox communizer position? Okay, yeah, so... 
we had this uh, understanding or that the communization position was the most radical or the only tendency that uh, would probably properly uh, criticize uh, or and go beyond uh, capitalism because the other tendencies would uh, one way or another only re-establish the class relations if they were victorious. I mean, all of these groups, ourselves included, were using Marxian terminology. So uh, this position can uh, appear very much like an anarchist point of view. And that might be true, but none of us or none of the people who are involved in these journals identified us as anarchists. And so um, we simply uh, viewed the abolition of capitalism be, uh, being the abolition of a long series of categories. Give us an example of some of these categories. That... Yeah, so wage labor and capital, uh, the commodity form, and all of these uh, yeah, categories that you usually can, you can read in, in Marx's Capital. But to this list was added also labor as an activity separate from life itself, uh, the state. You could say that the more things you added to this list, the more radical you were. And so this was like the, the, the environment in which theories developed. And, and this is what I became critical of, of this, this understanding of making the revolution by abolishing a lot of stuff that might not necessarily be integral to or forming part of what recreates the capitalist system. For example, around this international network of communizers, uh, there was a journal called SIC, International, international Journal of Communization, of which I participated, or Riff Raff and the other journals participated. There were articles that would romanticize or like emphasize riots or various kinds of acts in which it was seen that the proletariat were, was attacking its own situation and some kind of a, a desperation in the proletarian situation being like the new situation. So th this has to do also with uh, the inter interpretation of history that the theory communists advocated or their analysis. It was that the old workers' movement, both like the social democratic uh, variant and the council communist variant, had its basis in workers' self-affirmation. Affirming yourself as a class was the way in which you could wage class struggle and um, improve your situation. Theory communists, they argue that uh, in 1970, in the 1970s, this whole relation between classes was uh, going through a restructuring. And this restructuring uh, resulted in an end of the of workers' identity. And it was no longer possible to, to struggle as a class and to affirm yourself as a class. Instead, there was a tendency to, in this struggle itself, to uh, attack your own situation as a proletarian. I suppose this approach of trying to throw out all categories because they exist in capital can lead you to some interesting places, I would say. Yeah, so when I, I started to reflect on, on the implications of, of this uh, view of the revolution i i came to the position that i i don't i can't see a revolution taking place under such circumstances like attacking the the capitalist class by destroying trade routes or um, the idea also was to the revolution being some kind of snowball effect in which workers take or proletarians take control of means of production and re redistributing stuff for free and uh, in this way uh, you would have some kind of abolition of work and of money and of commodities by redistributing things and i simply uh, I, I started to to question this being necessary for for breaking with the capitalist logic and this in in, in 2013 and or shortly before, before that i decided to revisit capital reading capital to more properly understand what 
what is actually necessary to break the logic of capital. When I did this, I basically came to the conclusion that it is not necessary or it's not, it, it's not, you cannot just add a list of, of categories like that. You have to see what is capital and, and what, what is uh, necessary from the point of view of, 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 of the logic in, in capital from Marx's point of view. Right. So be. it's important to understand what exactly Marx was critiquing about capital. Yeah. <laughs> And so this is the background of the, the, the article that I sent you. And so here I, I try to um, take the commodity as the point of departure instead of value or labor time. Right. So let me see. Let, let, let's hit into it a, a wee bit. Would it be fair to say that in the communization kind of sphere i like i i don't i have not been uh or i have not really read any communization stuff when we're writing the book donald has been reading a lot of it so he's been, he's going to be the man behind the chapter on that so forgive me if i'm asking dumb and crude questions here peter but is it fair to say that that there is seems to be a conflation of abstract labor with value Yes, you could say that, but some people would still argue that those are indeed uh, very closely related. But cru more crucially, I think there's a conflation of um, abstract labor with calculation of a labor time calculation and uh, organization of society around labor or work as a separate activity. Can you expand on that? So... Um, the, there was this uh, implicit and, uh, and sometimes made explicit point of view uh, in the communization current that it, as soon as labor being uh, some kind of uh, you're obliged to work or the, the results of production must be shared in accordance with some kind of scheme. Or what does Marx call it? Just like a labor, to a labor planning, labor token system or whatever. Yes, exactly, exactly. And so this was um, interpreted as Marx not being uh, mature enough or like uh, th this was, would be so kind of a state capitalist gem in Marx himself and, and, and like the, the Soviet Union and, and other, other examples of, of the working class uh, taking power or a party in the name of the working class taking power. And then because of this... Uh, the separation between the, the lower stage and the higher stage of, of communism was being rejected. And so for the, the communization perspective, the view was that the revolution would be the introduction of the higher stage of, of, of communism uh, immediately. Right. So I think there was somebody on Twitter kind of went kind of semi-viral, I think a few months ago, but somebody had like, you know, got to the the end of some chapter deep into volume three. And there was a quote here about Marx talking about, about communism. But there's, a, there's an essence of, I feel sometimes that the idea seems to be that calculation in and of itself is oppressive, as opposed to the class relations that underlie a specific type of calculation. But the quote here is, after the ab abolition of the capitalist mode of production, but still retaining social production, the determination of value continues to prevail in the sense that the regulation of labor time and the distribution of social labor among the various production groups, ultimately, the bookkeeping encompassing all this becomes more essential than ever. Yeah, yeah. So it's like Marx is like talking about, you know, communism, we're not going to get rid of like bookkeeping and understanding how production works and the amount of time it takes to to make shoes or, or, or cars or solar panels, that it's important to understand all this. It's just as important as it is to capitalism. And But like some people see that, like oh, on Twitter, this guy was like, you know, throwing, flipping the bird to Marx going, what the fuck, I get 2,000 pages in? And he's suddenly talking about like, you know, calculating things. And this just sounds like capitalism, you know. Yes, exactly. And this quote was, uh, was crucial to me writing this text because, and, and, and there are more examples of Marx talking about bookkeeping and labor being like a basis of like organizing, reorganizing the new society. And uh, instead of simply uh, rejecting Marx or saying like, oh, he was wrong doing this, uh, saying uh, this or that, uh, I was trying to make sense of the argument 
And so the way I saw it was that Marx focuses on the commodity form, the commodity form leading to capitalist commodity production and uh, capitalist commodity production leads to accumulation and the perpetuation of of the working class the fact that labor takes the form of value is of course central to understanding capital but the quantitative nature of labor that is not that is not the problem but rather the way in which through the commodity form there is a dynamic in which workers and or capitalists or the uh, the various uh, agents are not in control but are being uh, are, are part of a uh, well self reproducing mode of production yeah value not being the central category uh, or like the maybe i can just quote from my text here capital is self expanding value dead labor that enslaves living labor it is therefore easy to see why some might wish to make value and abstract labor the main target of social critique. If abstract labor is the root out of which the categories of la- capital spring, wage, labor, profit, modern land, rent, accumulation, etc., then it must be abolished for a classless community to be established. This could conceivably take place in a revolution where the means of existence are made available to all without restriction gratis, since the compulsion to work for a wage then falls away. A social reorganization that, on the contrary, relies on work as a distinct social activity would retain abstract labor and thus constitute the dead end. And so this identification of labor with value, with capital, I believe is is central to uh, this uh, perspective of the revolution or this interpretation. Right. You know, in any society, there will be you know, Marx makes this point again and again. I think it's like that, you know, every society is is interested in the productivity of labor, right? It's always uh, a feature of every mode of production. But what we're trying to do, I think, by getting rid of capitalism and, and, get, and going to communism is that we're trying to get rid of, essential, we're trying to, you know, end wage labor and end unearned incomes, you know, in the lower stage. And... You know, this analysis of, of capital and, on you know, surplus labor and stuff like that, unearned incomes, that's kind of the root of what we're really trying to break. Yes, but the, um, what, what, the thing, what, what's interesting here, I think, is that there is uh, also a tendency within capitalist production to abolish labor because competition causes uh, savings in in labor. But this does not result in less labor being necessary on the whole, but rather new branches of production are being established. So the development of, the, of, 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 of capitalism actually creates the basis of, of society in which less necessary labor uh, would be required. And this is also something that Marx talks about in Volume 3 and elsewhere. So I think it's important to understand how you can say both things at the same time, or like to to see that uh, yes, it, it would be very difficult to make a revolution without uh, taking into consideration uh, the reproduction of, of of life. But at the same time, uh, it's not necessary to see uh, labor being forever central to to life, because if we take control of uh, if humanity takes control of its destiny, and it will no no longer need to um, be focused on on accumulation, then uh, the productivity, the labor, the increased labor productivity can actually free up time, reduce necessary labor, and at some point we might be in a situation in which it is not necessary to have a high re- requirement for performing labor or labor being uh, sort of like uh, something that needs to be a burden to to be shared and I, I think capitalism does actually point towards such a future but uh, it would be necessary first to go through the lower stage of, of socialism or or communism I suppose it's it's about the distinction really as well between labor and alienated labor 
Yeah, yes. Uh, how would you uh, describe alienated labor? Something that seems to dominate you that, you know, that is not done of your own want or desire or love. So that one can imagine for a, a person who likes doing pottery in their home, in their shed, that la- that is labor, right? It's a labor of love. But somebody working in a factory doing the same job, it could be uh, alienated labor and be oppressive. So it's not so much that communism is seeking to destroy labor, you know, of itself, but alienated labor. Yeah, sure. Uh, This is a related discussion, I think. But uh, I think even in a situation where, like uh, in a movement uh, from below in which the working class takes control of the means of production and and so on, in order to reproduce itself or to to fulfill the the needs of uh, its members, it will actually be necessary to have some kind of requirement for uh, work or, or expectation to work. And so I think this having a, a sphere that is distinct from just free time will be necessary evil. O- of course, that should be democratically decided, but it, it, this, this is, a, is a problem. I think there are some, uh, uh, the, the, it, they could, there is a danger of like society imposing itself upon the individual and 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 so i don't think this is something that is uh, like uh, would automatically be uh, a peaceful um, like uh, evolution or natural evolution but one could see uh, this being a necessity but trying to limit this sphere or sphere of necessity or producing for society as opposed to just living your your lives or or producing in uh as you what you describe a non alienated way performing gardening or <laughs> whatever it it seems to me that you say at the start that communism must seriously answer the question of material reproduction, and like I think that's just absolutely fundamentally true, and I would think that the types of categories that the communizers seek to you know, be more radical by getting rid of this category and that category and other categories. I feel like that dealing with this question of material reproduction kind of forces one to reject that kind of analysis and leads one down the road to the type of inquiry that you have made in this article. Yes, exactly. So I I was basically, I was asking myself the question, do I believe in this sort of revolution taking place? Could this actually happen? And I had to answer, no, I, I do not believe in this. I don't think you can have a revolutionary process that is basically the more or less the extension of a, a riot or or something like that. I simply couldn't believe this anymore, uh, or the implications of this would were became absurd to me. And so this is why I uh, came back to capital and trying to understand, well, okay, uh, let's see, capitalist society is unsustainable. We need to get rid of it, but what is actually necessary instead of just assumed to be necessary. Uh, and this is why I go back to the fundamental categories and uh, starting from the commodity. Right. So in the, in the article, you do a kind of, would it be fair to say you do a kind of like a, a condensed form of, say, like the first part of capital where you're inquiring into the commodity and use value and the value form. To get an understanding for why it is that Marx is focusing on this, like what is the relevance of this analysis for communists and communist theory? Yes, I tried to follow Marx very closely, starting with the simple value form uh, leading up to money, and then production of commodities not being um, having any purpose unless you um, want to make more money. So there's no no reason to um, invest money to produce if you're not producing for yourself, if you're producing for, for others, if you're not uh, into um, producing for profit. And the, produc- and the production for profit leads to competition and accumulation in turn causes the working class to continue to exist instead of being like workers being liberated from, from work. Uh, despite by this being uh, an integral part of uh, of capitalist production as well. 
Uh, and so I, I'm not sure if I succeeded completely, but I, I try. I, what I've tried to do is to follow this logic as closely as possible and, and to formulate the problem as we need to break the logic of accumulation, both to, uh, in order to liberate ourselves from life or work, but also because uh, this uh, process of accumulation is destroying the earth. Right. And, you know, we can see like in, in the argument, the, you know, that you're following Marx's argument that the competitive nature of private production, that private individual capitalist producers producing for sale in the market means that they're constantly and how the how socially necessary labor time operates. They're constantly trying to increase their own labor productivity to gain more surplus and gain higher profits. And this dynamic you know, is baked into the cake of capitalism for ever increasing production, that communism has to be able to break with this compulsion for accumulation in this negative sense. Yes, exactly. And so one way of like breaking breaking this would be killing the patient, which I would be sort of destroying material production and then you can get rid of uh, capitalism as well. But maybe we should not go down that road. So, what what I was doing while, while preparing preparing this article, but when I started uh, looking at these uh, issues, was that I was basically uh, playing with spreadsheets in which I uh, saw I had a I had a. Uh, now, we're a uh, now we're talking. Yeah. Now we're now now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was really looking into the quantitative categories of capital and uh, an expanding capitalist system and i was thinking for myself where i was just thinking hmm let's uh, maybe we could reverse this and i instead of having uh, accumulation i put in a, a minus sign i had negative accumulation and and what happened well you could uh, maintain I, I what i was what i saw uh, in front of me at the computer was that you could maintain a level of material production while reducing necessary labor time and by implication reducing the part of uh, the day which would be necessary uh, the realm the realm of, of a necessity diminished in favor of the the realm of freedom and i was thinking well it would be pretty cool if we could uh, sort of uh, uh, do this in uh, an, <laughs> an organized fashion you told me previously that when you started going down this route of looking at a communist production from a quantitative point of view with the you know taking marx's analysis of capitalism into account it led you on your uh, i think your your boards where you were discussing you know communism that it led to you saying in a well i i think in a somewhat pejorative fashion but like that you know perhaps we need to maintain value for communism can you explain what you mean by that and can you Tell us about what the reaction among communizers to your kind of mic drop or whatever you want to call it. Yes, exactly. So I had been reading this quote that you referenced earlier, this Marx quote, value persisting in communism as well. And uh, I presented this quote and I put forward the argument saying that, well, actually, value might not be the problem, but exchange value and accumulation. And so... So what was the reaction? Yeah, I, I, I had not yet written this article. This, uh, th this was t 10 years ago. So my argument was rather crude, but I, I basically put forward a position that, well, value is not the problem. Capital is the problem. Uh, exchange value is a problem. And of course, uh, uh, nobody agreed with me, <laughs> but it, we had a very interesting discussion on this mailing list. And uh, I subsequently, um, quit this uh, tendency in, a, in, a, in a, not, not simply because of political differences, not because of any personal disagreements. And uh, yeah, if people simply agree, agree that, well, I understand that like, if you have this position, uh, it will be difficult to stay or to, be, to continue within, uh, within this, uh, this current or grouping. Well, I have a good quote for here for Engels. I don't know if you know this quote. Do you want to hear a good quote on this very topic? Of course. And we can discuss it. This is a letter he sent to Kautsky in, in uh, 1884. 
on on the kind of topic of value in communism. Okay, and he says you make the same mistake in commas, as Rod Bertus with value. According to you, current value is that of commodity production, but following the abolition of commodity production, value would also be changed. That is to say, value in itself would continue to exist and only its form would be modified. But in fact, however, economic value is a category specific to commodity production and disappears with the latter, as it likewise did not exist prior to commodity production. The relation of labour to the product before as after commodity production is no longer expressed under the value form. So this is kind of like Engels kind of going a bit hard against your idea of value being maintained. Yeah, I, and I think I would, uh, today I would agree with that. Uh, and I, was, I, I would concede that maybe uh, stressing that value continues to exist uh, is not not being true but but that that doesn't change very much in my my argument because my my basic point of view or or my my basic argument is that collective uh, organization of labor in an abstract sense or in abstraction from from concrete activities does not result in capital accumulation basically Right, you know, yeah, I, 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 we fundamentally agree on this. You know, I, I, it's more of a a point of emphasis, I think, that Engels is making here, because Marx says value in the sense, right? Yes, and Engels yes. is saying not value. Okay, he's like saying shut up, saying value, motherfucker. Well, Marx is okay to say value in the sense, and like from one thing that the book that we're writing, myself and Donald, and certainly comes true. I don't know if you've read yet the fundamental principles of communist production by the group of international communists. I would really recommend it because it, they've essentially gone down this same route that you go down in this article, right? But I I feel like that there are essentially we can see like the forms that exist under capitalism. We have kind of like mirror forms in communism, but the essences are entirely different. And to the extent that, like, there is, you know, value in communism, the social relations underlying the essence of it are are so different as to make it a different phenomena. Yeah, but I I, I think I agree. But um, if you if you argue that it is actually value, or it is some uh, actually uh, some kind of social abstraction that we do want to get rid of, although perhaps not immediately, because we cannot, we should not uh, just destroy the basis of, of current social reproduction or reproduction of life but to to say that yeah we we try to organize value in a in a conscious manner if you, if we call it if we would call this value we would say that yeah we have not uh, yet reached uh, the goal or the, the final goal uh, of this process well, I, I would go back on, I would kind of debate with you there a little bit. As in, you know, you know, Marx makes the case that, you know, every every society is interested on in, like the productivity of labor and how long it takes to do things. And I don't think that, you know, maybe, you know, if we have like some incredible, you know, replicators and stuff like that sometime in the future where it literally doesn't really become, you, it becomes unlimited. But, you know, that's not the world we live in and unlikely to ever be the world we live in. That like productivity of labor is always a society is always interested in it, regardless if you completely break the link between labor and consumption, which is I think what Marx is getting to in the higher stage of communism, where you know where everything is what what is it um to each according to their needs from each according to the to their labor whatever I'm saying there I I, I can't believe I don't know that quote off the top of my head from but, each according to their abilities to each according to their needs exactly. So that there still is like abilities and work being done, but the, the distributive link between those has has broken. And like, whereas in lower stage communism, there is still a, that link. There, there is still that bourgeois right. OK, but there is no right to exploit or uh, charge interest or gain a rent in the lower stage. Yes, I, I agree. What I tried to do in uh, in in this with my text from commodity from the commodity to communism, is to uh, look at the transition from the lower to the higher stage of communism as a kind of uh, 
de process of deaccumulation, uh, in which I take the, uh, the a table of, of accumulation and reversing it, and uh, it, it doesn't uh, go down to zero uh, because I, I can't I don't know what happens when you go down at when you the realm of necessity is reaching a certain point. Perhaps things will be very different, but I do think that decreasing uh, the reduction of labor time is is the basic premises of a truly free community. I'm not sure we need to reach zero before there is some kind of qualitative change in the way we we relate to each other and and to relate to work. Yeah, like fundamentally, I think if you're, you know, if we only need to work 20 minutes a day and I work 15, I come in five minutes late and somebody else works 22, people aren't really bothered about the income differential between that. Whereas if I come in uh, and I do six hours and you do nine hours, I think at that stage, you know, people yeah. think, hey, what the, what the fuck's going on here? Exactly. Uh, but uh, so... Uh... Maybe this is in uh, very far into the future. Maybe some, but maybe some at some point we will have uh, even more automa- uh, automation. But without going into science, um, science fiction, I believe that just uh, putting a stop to to accumulation or this uh, forced uh, lo- logic that is being forced upon us as a society, even with today's technology, we could. Um, have um, maintained a very high level of life, working uh, substantially less than today, and and that this would also be necessary to deal with um, global heating and uh, and the uh, destruction of of, uh, of, uh, of nature, basically. I, I feel like a little bit there is like that I could imagine for a proper transition from our current economy to a green economy could require... Like not not degrowth, but it's de- it it you could have growth in the economy, but it, it it depends on what the growth is in. You know, for example, if you were to rewild an economy or to you know change the nature of the agricultural system, that it could require increasing amounts of labor, but that increased amount of labor it could be a positive for the environment, like that it doesn't have to be destructive in the same way as capital that the class relations underlying it determine you know very different outcomes that, that might well be true I and mean, it, it, it may be the case that uh, certain activities will will require more labor for it to be sustainable whereas other activities could be lines of or lines of production be abolished but this is as i see it more from a, from a short-term perspective like what we could do immediately after the re- revolution but if if you just look at what I try to to look at uh, in this text is like the logic. What is the what would be the logic, the change in logic between capitalism and 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 socialism, and that would be productivity gains would be liberating instead of enslaving. And I can't I can't say how how much uh, labor productivity would would uh, develop outside of the, the, the capitalist context, but I do think that science will continue to advance. Uh, and uh, when we are sort of working to improve our lives, to set it, we're working to, for need satisfaction and sustainable production, on a long-term basis, things will change a lot. You know, fundamentally, I think, you know, that people want to work less. And the, the whole thing for communism is that people will decide their own level of consumption, their own level of work. And I can imagine, you know, to me, it just seems like an obvious fact that productivity would overwhelmingly go towards increasing our free time. Yeah, we we actually, in the book, we will be, I think we've come up with some extremely interesting things on the nature of productivity under communist production. Uh, One thing I feel like that communists today seem to concede productivity to the capitalist system i think unnecessarily due to the failures of the leninist state capitalist approach and you know i think fundamentally to marx and 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 engels was how communism could be so much more productive than capitalism and i think we i think 
I think we will regain that concept. I certainly try to regain that concept in the book. And I do think that is a, a kind of a fundamental aspect to communism as well. I, I don't think, um, we, we, we can't be sure, but uh, there is no, we could be a bit conservative here, I suppose. Maybe the impetus to innovate will not be the same, but surely there will still be advances in, in science. And, and I don't think it's necessary to say it will be uh, no innovation or no productivity gains, or it will be so much more productive. We don't know, but I don't think we'll have uh, complete stagnation or, or uh, losing all of the productivity gains. So one thing in the text you talk about in, in one small point, it's not a major element of it, is you know the nature of a communist revolution not on one country, but on a world scale. Do you want to talk about some of your thoughts on that? Well, I think this is basically the rejection of socialism in one country, uh, which is not uh, unique in my understanding as opposed to others, non- or anti-Stalinists. So I, I, I cannot see or cannot envisage socialism or communism being established in a situation where you have countries that continue to be capitalist and uh, and therefore expansionists are having this uh, well ac- accumulation um, continuing to exist so i cannot really see how uh, like a community that is no longer uh, being under this logic of uh, accumulation that they could exist uh, alongside such other next to non- non-socialist or capitalist societies what is your your view on that well, I kind of see it as a process, to be honest. I feel like that I think we will show in, in our book some like very deep reasons for why productivity will be higher than capitalist productivity. You know, Marx mentions a couple of these here and there in Capital, but I think we've found a couple of extra kind of dynamics. And like I, I just feel like the the chances of a world revolution happening everywhere at once is I, I feel like that is unrealistic as as the things we've been critiquing the communizers for thus far. And you know I think if you look to capitalism, it didn't appear everywhere at once. It took hold places. Uh, it was able to expand because of the inherent dynamics of it. And I feel if communism is to be you know, more than a a pipe dream of podcasters and writers and radicals, that there would have to be material dynamics in it that would make it be able to defeat capitalism. That's that's the approach that I feel is like a materialist approach and that we'll be kind of laying out in the book. But isn't this uh, simply the question of a period of transition between, between capitalism and the lower stage of communism? No, I feel like we think that the Transition is is not a long period from, you know, the transition itself. Personally, we feel like you win a revolution, you have a short period of transition, you have low stage communism. And at that stage, you know, if your low stage communism has its own different dynamics than a transition period. In in just one country, for example. Well, I I don't think there's very few, like I think it would have just have to be in an area that's big enough to be initially defensible, whatever that means. Okay. Right. Uh, like I would think the problem with the the Soviet Union was not that they didn't have enough steel or oil, right? The problem is that they're inherently with their how their social relations were set up still kept all the capitalist categories, you know, wage what, labor, etc. And what about the military competition with uh, with the West? Right. So there's elements there, but like even I don't think like I think a lot of I think if we were just talking playing all the stupid geopolitics I would think a lot of the Soviet spending on military stuff would hardly would hardly have been rational, you know. After you have five thousand megaton bomb, five thousand nuclear bombs, why do you need you know fifteen thousand? You know, I think that there are lots of inherent mm-hmm. dynamics in that that, <laughs> okay, so that would mean, be different in a communist society. Apparently, you would only need two hundred um, uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, and then you would, uh, if you had any more, you will just destroy the whole earth. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so the, the, I think that we have so, to... So, so, so basically, you're... Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make fun of you here. Yeah, um, no, totally. But, but, yeah, I think... uh, but, but, but if you, you, you can imagine a situation in which you, you take power and you have 200 nuclear weapons or more, 
and that allows you to uh, have a peaceful communist society because the outside world will not be able to do anything. Well, no. You... <laughs> well, I think I think there's an element of that certainly, but I think the the, the dynamics of communism have to be expansionary, right? Okay. Right. But what, what, so what, it's what, either it's one or the other. It's either world revolution everywhere at once, or it's co- communism if it gets expand if it gets established. It's expansionary, like capitalism was. There's no okay. other ways. There's just those um, two. You know, that's the choice. Okay. Well, I, I I haven't really thought so much about that issue. I had more like taken for granted the uh, like the world revolutionary point of view. But uh, I would be interested in reading your argument in the in your future book. Yeah, whenever that comes out. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Is there anything else, then, Peter? We haven't chatted about yet that you feel you'd like to talk about from the article, or anything else, just in general. I'm not sure. Not any more. Uh, not anything besides that. I think it's important to uh, try to put forward your argument as clearly as possible, so as to have good conversation and to move forward, and to avoid um, obscuring the positions of others. So, I, my my point of view is that what we are doing is some kind of um, it's a scientific project, or we're, we're trying to investigate. We don't know everything. Um, we don't have the truth. But uh, we need to like investigate together how to uh, get out of this system, and uh, and so I think it's important simply to uh, to have the civilized debate. Well, I, I much prefer a punch up. Let's be honest. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks very much, Peter, for coming on the show today. Yeah, thank you. It was interesting talking to you. Pleasure to be part of the your podcast, and you have a very interesting guest. And uh, this subject is central to, um, to, to your podcast. Yeah, no, I just feel exactly the same as you. It's a, it's a, I feel like, you know, we need to sit down on our asses and do some scientific thinking on, on these problems. It's not so much to throw our energies into forming sects or parties or unions so much as to figure out what the hell we want to do with them before we bother doing that. Yes, exactly. And we should be able to... Um, we have the courage to recognize where we uh, have changed our opinions or point of view and not to stubbornly defend uh, a position. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>